Yuletide in Many Lands, Mary Pogue Pringle and Clara A. Uran. This book is available from Gutenberg.org and is in the public domain. Chapter 1 Yuletide of the Ancients There in the temple, carved in wood, the image of great Odin stood, and other gods with Thor supreme among them. As early as two thousand years before Christ, Yuletide was celebrated by the Aryans. They were sun worshippers and believed the sun was born each morning, rode across the upper world, and sank into his grave at night. Day after day, as the sun's power diminished, these primitive people feared that he would eventually be overcome by darkness and forced to remain in the underworld. When, therefore, after many months, he apparently wheeled about and grew stronger and stronger, they felt that he had been born again. So it came about that at Weirlutid, the turning time, and I am pretty certain I mispronounced that, so if anyone knows the proper pronunciation, please let me know. So it came about that at the turning time there was great rejoicing at the annual rebirth of the sun. In the myths and legends of these, our Indo-European ancestors, we find the origin of many of the Yuletide customs now in vogue. According to the younger Edda, Woden or Odin, the pioneer of the north, a descendant of Saturn, fled out of Asia. Going through Russia to Saxland, now known as Germany, he conquered that country and left one of his sons as ruler. Then he visited Franklin, Jutland, Sweden, and Norway, and established each one of his many sons on a throne. This pioneer traveler figures under nearly two hundred different names, and so it is difficult to follow him in his wanderings. As Woden, he established throughout the northern nations many of the observances and customs common to the people of the Northland today. The Ada gives an ancient account of Baldur, the sun god, who was slain because of the jealousy of Loki fire. Loki knew that everything in nature except the mistletoe had promised not to injure the great god Baldur. So he searched for the mistletoe until he found it growing on an oak tree on the eastern slope of Valhalla. He cut it off and returned to the place where the gods were amusing themselves by using Baldur as a target, hurling stones and darts and trying to strike him with their battle axes. But all these weapons were harmless. Then Loki, giving the twig of mistletoe to the blind god Hoder, directed his hand and induced him to throw it. When the mistletoe struck Baldur, it pierced him through and through, and he fell lifeless. So on the floor Baldur lay dead and round, lay thickly strewn swords, axes, darts, and spears, which all the gods in sport had idly thrown at Baldur, whom no weapon pierced or clove, but in his breast stood fixed the fatal bow of mistletoe, which Lok the accuser gave to Holder, an unwitting Holder threw. Against that alone had Baldur's life no charm. From Matthew Arnold's Baldur Dead Great excitement prevailed among the assembled gods and goddesses when Baldur was struck dead and sank into hell and they would have slain the god of darkness had it not occurred during their peace stead, which was never to be desecrated by deeds of violence. More on hell in a bit. The season was supposed to be one of peace on earth and goodwill to man. This is generally attributed to the injunction of the angels who sang at the birth of Christ, but according to a much older story, the idea of peace and goodwill at Yuletide was taught centuries before Christ. Now back to hell. Hell or his grave. The terms were once synonymous. Jumping back out of tonight's reading, hell is also the name of a goddess whom the underworld supposedly was named for, and I will find more on her to read later. According to the Edda, gifts from the gods and goddesses were laid on Baldur's bier, and he in turn sent gifts back from the realm of darkness into which he had fallen. However, it is probably from the Roman Saturnalia that the free exchange of presents and the spirit of revelry have been derived. The Druids held the mistletoe in great reverence because of its mysterious birth. 
When the first new growth was discovered, it was gathered by the white-robed priests, who cut it from the main bough with a golden sickle, never used for any other purpose. The food peculiar to this season of rejoicing has retained many features of the feasting recorded among the earlier people. The boar made his appearance in mythological circles when one was offered as a gift to Frey, god of rain, sunshine, and the fruits of the earth. This boar was a remarkable animal. He could run faster than a horse, through the air and over the water. Darkness could not overtake him, for he was symbolical of the sun, his golden bristles typifying the sun's rays. At one time the boar was believed to be emblematical of golden grain, as he was the first to teach mankind the art of plowing. Because of this service he was most revered by our mythological ancestors. In an account of a feast given in Valhalla to the dead heroes of many battles, Sehrimner, a sacred boar, was served. Huge pieces were apportioned to the deceased heroes, and the meat had such a revivifying effect that, restored to life, they called for arms and began to fight their battles over again. An abundance of heavenly mead made from goat's milk and honey was provided for the feasts, and on occasions ale, too, was served. Toasts were usually drunk in honor of Bragi, god of poetry, eloquence, and song. The gods pledged themselves to perform remarkable deeds of courage and valor as they tossed off horn after horn of mead and ale. Each time their mighty valor grew until there was no limit set to their attainments. It is possible that their boastful pledges may have given rise to the term to brag. Apples were the favorite fruit, as they prevented the approach of age and kept the gods and goddesses perpetually young and vigorous. Certainly Yuletide was a very merry season among the ancient people who feasted, drank and danced in honor of the return of the sun, the god of light and new life. When messengers went through the various countries bearing tidings of a new religion and the birth of a son who brought light and new life into the whole world, they endeavored to retain as many of the established customs as possible, but gave to the old-time festivals a finer character and significance. As the fact of Christ's birth was not recorded, and there was no certainty as to its date, the early Christian fathers very wisely ascribed it to Yuletide, changing the occasion from the birthday of the sun to that of the sun. For a while the birth of Christ was celebrated on dates varying from the 1st to the 6th of January, on the dates of certain religious festivals such as the Jewish Passover or the Feast of Tabernacles, but the 25th of December, the birthday of the sun, was ever the favorite date. Pope Julius, who reigned from 337 to 352 A.D. after a careful investigation, considered it settled beyond doubt that Christ was born on or about the 25th of December, and by the end of the 5th century that date was very generally accepted by Christians. The transition from the old to the new significance of Yuletide was brought about so quietly and naturally that it made no great impression on the mind of the masses, so nothing authentic can be learned of the early observance of Christmas. The holly, laurel, mistletoe, and other greens used by the Druids still served as decorations of the season, not as a shelter for fairies as in former days, but as emblems of resurrection and of immortal hope. The glorious luminary of day, whether known as Balder, Baal, Sol, or any other of the innumerable names by which it was called by the primitive peoples, still gladdens the hearts of mortals at Yuletide by turning back, as of old. Only today it yields its place to a superior power in whose honor Yuletide is observed. All Christendom owes a debt of gratitude to its pagan forebears for the pleasant features of many of its holidays, and especially for those of Yuletide. The fathers of the early church showed rare wisdom in retaining the customs of these anti-Christian festivals, imbuing them with the spirit of the new faith, and making them emblematic of a purer love and hope. New Year's Day as a feast day is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, on record. It is mentioned by Tactus in the first century, 
but first referred to as a Christian festival around the year 567. In Rome, the day was dedicated by Numa to the honor of god Janus, for whom Julius Caesar named the month of January. Numa ordained that it should be observed as a day of good humor and good fellowship. All grudges and hard feelings were to be forgotten. Sacrifices of cake, wine, and incense were to be made to the two-faced god who looked forward and backward. Men of letters, mechanics, and others were expected to give to the god the best they had to offer of their respective arts. It was the great occasion of the entire year, as it is now in many countries. The date of New Year's Day has varied among different nations. Among the Egyptians, Chinese, Jews, and Romans, it has been observed on dates varying from March 1st to December 25th. It was as late as the 16th century before the date of January 1st was universally accepted as the New Year by the Romans. Nations retaining the Gregorian calendar, such as Russia and Greece, observe it thirteen days later than those who reckon time by the Julian calendar. Among northern nations, the love of fire and light originated the custom of kindling bonfires to burn out the old year and destroy all evil connected with its past. Light has long been an expression of joy and gladness among all branches of the Aryan race. The Greek and Latin churches still term Christmas the Feast of Lights, and make it a period of brilliancy in the church and home. The Protestant covers the Christmas tree with lighted candles, and builds a glowing fire on the hearth. The innate love of light and warmth, the inheritance from the sun worshippers of ages past, is always dominant in humanity at Yuletide festivals. The King of Light father of aged time, hath brought about that day which is the prime, to the slow gliding months when every eye wears symptoms of a sober jollity, and every hand is ready to present some service in a real compliment. King Olaf's Christmas The King That Gave Christianity to Norway King Olaf's Christmas at Drontheim, Olaf the king heard the bells of Yuletide ring, as he sat in his banquet hall, drinking the nut-brown ale, with his bearded berserks hale and tall. Three days his Yuletide feasts he held with bishops and priests, and his horn filled up to the brim, but the ale was never too strong, nor the saga man's tale too long for him. Or his drinking horn the sign he made of the cross divine, as he drank and muttered his prayers, but the berserks evermore made the sign of the hammer of Thor over theirs. The gleams of the firelight dance upon helmet and hauberk and lance, and laugh in the eyes of the king, and he cries to Halfred the scald, grey-bearded, wrinkled and bald, Sing! Sing me a song divine, with a sword in every line, and this shall be thy reward and he loosed the belt at his waist, and in front of the singer placed his sword. Quern bitter of hawk on the good, wherewith at a stroke he hewed the millstone through and through, and foot breath of Thorlaf the strong, were neither so broad nor so long nor so true. Then the skald took his harp and sang, and loud through the music rang the sound of that shining word, and the harp-strings a clangor made, as if they were struck with the blade of a sword. And the berserks round about broke forth in a shout that made the rafters ring. They smote with their fists on the board, and shouted, Long live the sword and the king! But as the king said, O oh, my son, I miss the bright word in one of thy measures and thy rhymes, and Halford the skald replied, In another twas multiplied three times. Then King Olaf raised the hilt of iron cross-shaped and gilt, and said, Do not refuse, count well the gain and the loss, Thor's hammer or Christ's cross, choose. And Halfred the skald said, This in the name of the Lord I kiss, who on it was crucified. And a shout went round the board, In the name of Christ the Lord who died. Then over the waste of snows the noonday sun uprose, Through the driving mists revealed, Like the lifting of the host by incense clouds almost concealed. 
On the shining wall a vast and shadowy cross was cast from the hilt of the lifted sword, and in the foaming cups of ale the berserkers drank wassail to the Lord. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow And thus ends chapter 1. I am Teresa Garcia, or Amehana Arashi. I am beginning to read for the Trotsdale Library, Yuletide in Many Lands, by Mary P. Pringle, Reference Librarian, Minnesota Public Library Commission, and Clara A. Uran. This book was published in 1916, and so far as I know, remains in the public domain, accessible via gutenberg.org. My plan is to read this entire book